outside uh, af after it is finished. Um, my name is Brittany Hernandez. I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us, um, you know, from across the neuromuscular community, our advocates. Um, this is a brand new series that we are really pleased to be able to offer the community. And obviously, we're starting kind of with the basics. It's 101 today. And so we'll walk you through, you know, MDA's priorities and, and some other issues um, before we get moving. If anybody wants to ask a question, please feel free to enter it into the Q&A. Um, this is the bottom of your screen. And you can go ahead and type it in there, and, and we'll take it from there. Um, you can move to the next slide. So again, I'm Brittany Hernandez, the Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy. Today, we are joined by the rest of the MDA Policy and Advocacy team, including Paul Neltmeyer, our Director of Regulatory Affairs, Mark Gottschalk, our Advocacy Specialist, and Mark Fisher, our Advocacy Engagement Manager, who is running this webinar today. So we have a pretty packed agenda for today and lots of opportunities for Q&A. Um, so first thing we'll do is go through MDA's advocacy priorities for 2020. Next, we'll talk about why MDA advocates, uh, the role of volunteer advocates, what you can do right now and what's next. And you'll see this picture on this slide is from our advocacy conference that took place in October of last year. It was wildly successful. These are just a few of the people who attended, um, but we had a really great, great time there. And we are really pleased to be able to offer this opportunity to not just advocate in person, but to do so virtually and to join us virtually, especially right now. Uh, we know that, you know, now is an especially challenging time. There's lots of uncertainty, but, you know, something that we can all do to come together in this kind of opportunity that we're trying to seize right now is, is continue to, to advocate for ourselves and, and those we care about. And so we're really glad to have all of you here, especially considering, um, you know, kind of the state of things as they are now. You can go to the next slide. So our 2020 advocacy priorities, um, we divide them into three, um, three issue areas. The first is access to care and therapies from day one accelerating therapeutic development and empowerment and independence. And we'll go through in the next couple of slides talking about what each one of those means. Now, I'll caution you to let you know that just because we're gonna talk about a few issues in each one of these subject areas does not mean that that is all we do on each of those issues or, or even outside of these. Um, so uh, just you know, kind of bear with us. And then if you have any questions about anything else that we're doing that maybe wasn't covered there, put it into the Q&A and we'll address it um, as, as we move on. So the first issue, um, access to care and therapies from day one, it's very broad. Um, this area really encompasses everything from early access to detection, so genetic testing, uh, genetic counseling services, um, including newborn screening, to you know what does it take to help people who are diagnosed with a condition under MDA's umbrella uh, to get the care that they need. And so that is you know applicable to everything from accessible and affordable health care insurance that covers everything you need for for you know any matter of things including a pre-existing condition like a neuromuscular disease um, ensuring that that protections and you know current federal protections that apply to um, health insurance remain there that the Medicaid program across the country is fully funded and able to react to the needs of the neuromuscular community and that you know even that our caregivers and our family members have access to the kind of care that they need to take to, to be be able to take care of you know a family member who's living with a condition and because you know we take a very holistic approach here at MDA that if the whole family doesn't have access to the health care that they need that it's really just not it's not a great state to be in and so we really do um, advocate for everyone to have to have really good really strong really accessible and affordable health insurance and that's something that we've been involved um, since you know we started an, an advocacy department at the organization you can go to the next slide I'll turn it over to Paul Nelmeyer well, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Paul Melmeyer. I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs here at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And I wanted to say just a few words on our second priority area for uh, 2020, and that's on accelerating therapeutic development for the neuromuscular disease community. 
At this point, we only have 12 FDA-approved therapies for eight neuromuscular disease conditions. And so that means that many in the community are still left without any FDA-approved therapy whatsoever. And even those who do have an FDA-approved therapy, oftentimes those therapies may be unsatisfactory. So we know that there's still a great amount of need in the community to have more and better therapies. And so we really are, are, are trying to uh, do everything we can policy-wise to address this lack of uh, effective treatments for those in the community. There are two areas in which we're prioritizing uh, you know, our, our involvement in accelerating therapeutic development. The first is to expand patient involvement opportunities at the Food and Drug Administration, as well as within biopharmaceutical companies to ensure that the therapies that are being developed are more patient-focused and are more patient-centric. Just a couple of examples of activities there include a patient-focused drug development meeting for the Pompeii disease community that we're looking forward to, to holding um, this summer. In addition to that, we are also looking for ways to integrate the patient voice in FDA processes, such as through advisory committee meetings or through the patient representative program or other programs that FDA puts forward to ensure the patients have a voice at the table as FDA is reviewing new therapies for neuromuscular disease conditions. And those are just a handful of the different initiatives and opportunities that we're trying to put forward to the community to ensure that patient voice is very loud and very strong when it comes to developing new therapies in neuromuscular diseases. The second area I wanted to cover is advocating for new, uh, advocating for innovative ways to accelerate therapeutic development and FDA review. And this is getting these hopefully more patient focused treatments to the patients quicker in a more efficient uh, manner so that therapies can reach patients who don't have any therapy right now that much quicker. And that includes looking very closely at the FDA regulatory process and making sure that it's working as efficiently as possible. In many time, many ways, it's not. That could be clinical trial designs that are uh, much too arduous. That could be endpoints that don't uh, actually reflect uh, the uh, specific um, you know, ways in which uh, the patient community is is looking for a therapy to, to improve their, uh, their, their uh, experience uh, in, in many, many other ways, uh, you know, expanding access to investigational therapies, making sure that uh, enrollments criteria are appropriate for specific conditions. Uh, that's what we're doing at the FDA. We're also making sure that the incentives that actually spur biopharmaceutical companies towards making therapies for neuromuscular disease uh, populations also remain strong, making sure they're being pushed in that direction to develop these new therapies. So there's a very broad number of ways in which we're getting involved for you uh, in trying to, to, to encourage more and better therapies to be uh, reaching the neuromuscular disease community quicker. I'll pass it along to my colleague, uh, Mark Gottschalk. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Gottschalk. Uh, I'm the advocacy, advocacy specialist here at MDA. Uh, and I'll be talking to you all about uh, empowerment and independence, our, our third pillar, uh, so to speak. Uh, so, uh, you know, this year is the uh, 30th anniversary of the uh, ADA. Uh, so we're looking to continue uh, the, the, the safety nets and the protections that the ADA has provided and continued uh, ongoing support. Um, however, that being said, the ADA does not cover uh, air travel. So we're working closely um, to ensure that uh, people in the neuromuscular disease community are protected while traveling. So what does that mean? Uh, that means when they arrive at the airport, that means if they have a wheelchair, that needs, if it needs to be stowed, it's properly being stowed, uh, making sure lavatories are accessible, uh, things of that nature. So we're working closely uh, with some partner organizations and, and the airlines to make sure that um, we, we have those, those protections. Uh, and lastly, um, we're working to make sure that um, the, the different workplaces uh, across the country are, are incentivized to make sure that they are continuing to uh, hire people with disabilities and within the neuromuscular community. Um, that, of course, means uh, could mean giving them tax breaks when there are um, tax breaks w w to, to when there's when there's uh, reconstruction that needs to be made or, or changes that need to be made within the organization to ensure uh, that the neuromuscular disease community has equal opportunity as everyone else. Uh, so with that being said, I will uh, pass it along. Thank you, Mark um, and Paul. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is obviously, you know, what's happening right now. Um, so we're all working from home right now, as you can see. Um, and, and the the issues of the coronavirus uh, pandemic and, and COVID-19 are definitely um, 
you know, kind of felt, you know, more strongly in the patient, in the pre-existing patient community and especially the neuromuscular disease and, and rare disease communities. And so we have been working um, across, you know, across other organizations with members of Congress, with the administration on ways that we can ensure that, you know, people living with neuromuscular conditions receive the care that they need if they are di diagnosed with COVID-19 and get all of the support that's necessary to help them get better. Um, so we have, you know, we, we have joined in support of a number of with the with the bills passed through that have passed through so far in Congress on you know COVID-19 relief for patients families. Um, we are continuing to work with both the administration and members of Congress on ensuring that whatever the next package is includes a number of, of protections that would be beneficial for patients um, and and living with neuromuscular conditions and, and other pre-existing conditions. Um, we want to be sure that people who, you know, require certain medications right now don't face a shortage of that because of this crisis and that they're able to get, you know, kind of longer fills on their medications so you don't have to go to the pharmacy as often so that we can promote social distancing that will help people from getting sick. Um, while all of this is happening, obviously, we still have all of our 2020 priorities that we just ran through with Paul and Mark. And so, you know, it's obviously a, um, a busy time for us and everyone else right now when it comes to advocating for our patients. Um, but we want to be sure that the community knows that we're still here and we're still pushing on everything that you've asked us to do um, and that we've identified as a high priority uh, for, the, for the neuromuscular community while we continue to advocate on these issues, you know, that are, that are really important at this current point in time. Time. Um, Paul, is there anything that you wanted to elaborate on, on on the FDA side here? I think that might be really useful to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll start with access to, to current therapies, uh, which is, uh, Brittany also mentioned a few points on ensuring folks are able to get reauthorizations for their prescriptions for a longer amount of time. This is incredibly important. Um, there's other ways in which we want to be sure that individuals are still able to access the therapies that um, they, they need, that are re required to, to perhaps manage um, their, their condition. And that includes access to, to home infusions at times, that includes access to care in the home, making sure that um, those, of those options are still available to the community as um, they're seeking treatments without having to potentially compromise um, your safety by going to a clinic or going to a medical facility for, for routine treatment. Um, that also includes carefully monitoring whether there are any shortages of treatments that uh, the neuromuscular disease community relies on. We know that supply chains are strained right now. Uh, the normal ways in which medicines are, are shipped from point A to point B um, are being interrupted in some ways. And in other times, there are medicines that might be actually used in response to the crisis uh, that might also be used within neuromuscular conditions that could then cause a, a shortage overall. So we're carefully monitoring the FDA's response to these potential shortages. And, and thus far, thankfully, there aren't any official shortages of therapies that the neuromuscular community relies on, but nonetheless, we're keeping a very close eye on it. Just the other thing I wanted to mention is for clinical trials that may be ongoing right now, therapies that have not yet been approved by FDA. Obviously, many disruptions that the, the COVID outbreak is, is causing to the clinical trial process as well. Trial sites are closing down. Individuals might not be able to fly to a trial site that they would have otherwise flown to or uh, even drive or take other modes of transportation to that trial site because, you know, frankly, we're social distancing, perhaps as a stay at home order in, in your in your specific jurisdiction and, and you would actually technically be forbidden to go to that trial site in certain circumstances. So these uh, sponsors and in, in, uh, institutional review boards and the FDA and all of these entities that are in charge of these clinical trials are trying to figure out what to do. And we wanna be sure that they're doing everything they can to make it as easy as possible for you or a loved one to continue to participate in a clinical trial and that that clinical trial is not going to fail as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. So we've sent comments to the FDA asking for them to issue further guidance and advice on this very issue. We're carefully monitoring what FDA is putting forward. And we're also talking very frequently with our biopharmaceutical partners to hear from them on uh, if they're still able to be successful in running their clinical trials. So we wanna be sure that this outbreak doesn't set us back in having new therapies reach the community as quickly as possible. Back to you, Brittany. Thanks, Paul. Um, I think we can go ahead and move on to our next slide down. Great. That would be me. So my name is Mark Fisher. I am our advocacy engagement manager here 
at MDA, and I am just thrilled to be able to talk to everyone on this webinar, our kickoff session, about what about our grassroots program and how you can help. I'm trying to make the slide progress, so uh, please bear with me as that happens. There we go. So um, we've heard a lot of great things from both Mark, Paul, and Brittany about our policy priorities and what we're fighting for every day on Capitol Hill. But I'd like to take a step back and ask why. Why are we doing this? I think many folks might be surprised that nonprofits like MBA even get involved in the political process, that we even, um, that we even go to Capitol Hill and ask lawmakers to support certain bills, that we even get involved in advocacy. And the reason is we have to, and we want to. And it, we want to do that because as our mission statement says, we're here to transform the lives of people affected by neuromuscular disease. We can't fulfill that mission if we don't have a strong advocacy program. We can't transform the lives of folks uh, with neuromuscular disease if, if the community cannot access the care that they need that Brittany talked about. We can't fulfill this mission if, not all, if all babies are not screened for conditions such as SMA and Pompeii. We can't transform the lives of people with neuromuscular disease if they can travel on airplanes uh, well, if, they, if, if they're still, if it's hard for them to travel. We can't transform the lives of people affected by neuromuscular disease if they don't have access to clinical trials. So in order for us to be successful in our mission, we have to have a robust and strong, obviously, program. And that's where you come in, because for us to be successful, we need a strong grassroots program to help us. So what are some of the ways that you can help and get involved? Well, the good news is there's a place for everyone in our grassroots program. Whatever you're interested, whatever you're comfortable with, there's something for you. And I like to break this out into two different areas, both online and offline. So in the online area, most of you probably already check off this first one, which is you receive timely email updates from us. Most of you probably get these because you're on this webinar. But if you're not, maybe this was forwarded to you or you found it on our Twitter account, I'll show you later how you can sign up to be part of our email program. In those emails, we routinely ask advocates to both email and tweet their members of Congress on issues that are important to them. And that's really important because members of Congress do listen to their constituents. It's crucial that they do not forget about the voice of the neuromuscular disease community while they're crafting legislation or voting on bills. I assure you, your voice does make a difference and you contacting your lawmaker goes a long way to make sure that the voice is not forgotten on Capitol Hill. We also, engage on the agency level and government agencies, things that Paul was talking about. And I think that might surprise uh, folks that our advocates do interact with the agencies such as the Health and Human Services or Department of Transportation or the Food and Drug Administration. It's crucial that they hear our voice as well because a lot of the things that they decide, the regulations they issue, issue or the roles that they issue, affect the neuromuscular disease community and they need to make sure that they hear our voice. So we do make sure they do that. The next thing that people can do online is share their story. We have right now on our advocacy site a place where you can share your story about how um, you are dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak. How are you handling this? We want to know how you're doing. And we receive many stories from that campaign and I'll talk about one of them a little later but you can share your story with us. And sharing your story is probably one of the most crucial things that our advocates can do. It really breaks through the noise. Myself or Paul or Mark or Brittany can go to Capitol Hill every day, and we do, and we try to convince lawmakers that this bill should be supported or co-sponsored. But sometimes you just need that crucial advocate voice to really hit it home with a lawmaker or a decision maker. And that's why sharing your story is really important. We do a lot of things offline as well. Hopefully when we get back to the time where this is possible and, and safe for the community, we can, we, usually, we can have advocates visit members of Congress's office, uh, have those face-to-face -face meetings, those one-on-one -on -one conversations with decision makers. As Brittany mentioned, we had a, a conference in the fall where we had many advocates come to DC and have those important one-on-one -on -one meetings. They also can pick up the phone the old fashioned way and call the member of Congress's office and, and advocate for an issue. And this might be more common in the, in the near future that this is, might be the predominant way that we can have those crucial one-on-one -on -one conversations with offices. Advocates can write blogs or other pieces. MDA has a large blog called Strongly and we have an advocate, we have an advocacy section on that blog where advocates are featured 
both we feature them, but they also author some blogs as well. They can also organize in their community. And I should add to this, add to this into the online section. There's a place for them to join webinars like this one. I just want to say before I move on, before any advocate would ever um, either email their member of Congress or tweet or call their member of Congress or go to an office, here we, at MDA, we'll make sure that you're prepared. We'll make sure you have a, the correct talking points or a script if it's a phone call. We'll provide a sample letter if you need, want to email a member of Congress. We make sure you're, you're prepared. You're giving us your time. The least we can do is make sure you're prepared to make sure that you are, um, you know how to advocate properly and, and make sure that you have what you need to do that. So that is our promise to you. All right, now that I've gone over what are certain things you can do? I really wanted to share some great recent examples of our advocates really stepping up and, and um, advocating for themselves in MDA. So the first one on the, on the left side is uh, Josh. He came to, he was in DC and he was able to visit his members of Congress during rare disease week here. Uh, he went to his member of Congress office and, and advocated for issues that are important to him and MDA. And you can see an awesome picture of him on the left opposing with the member of Congress's office. So that's an example of meeting with your member of Congress. On the right is a great example of how advocates have engaged with federal agencies. So in January, we had uh, our advocates reach out to Health and Human Service Secretary Alex Azar and urge him to restart a key newborn screening committee. Now, this was not a congressional action. This was one that we had folks direct to ahead of a federal agency. And we had over 1,100 advocates urge the secretary to restart this key committee that's crucial to the newborn screening program. And at the end of March, he, he agreed to do this. So this was a great victory for us. And it's to show that sometimes we need to advocate with our federal agencies, not just Congress. A next example on the left side is a blog written by Chris. He came to D.C. in the fall during a public policy and advocacy conference, and he was able to meet with multiple, multiple members of Congress during that time, attend some trainings, and really had a great experience here in D.C. Him and a bunch of other advocates, as Brittany said, came to D.C. during that time to participate in our advocacy conference. And he also wrote a blog about it. And this one is available also on the, our main MDA site and our Strongly blog. So this is an example of not only was he able to come to DC, but he was also able to write about his experience. And the final one on the right is this is Heather from Seattle. She actually stood up, uh, she actually shared her story with us during our Sherry Story campaign around COVID-19. She wrote to us to talk about how she's dealing with the current pandemic. And it was a really powerful story. And not only have you seen a powerful quote on the screen, we're able to highlight her story and an, app, and an email we sent to advocates encouraging them to share their story. We shared it on social media, and we also just were able to share her story uh, during Giving Tuesday Now. So we were able to really um, take her experience, and she was able to, to she was able to take her experience and was able to help MD8 out. So that's an example of how powerful a story can be. So. If we had ever would ask advocates to help us out and raise their voice, we need to make sure it's meaningful and we will do that. We won't ask advocates to advocate or take action unless we think it's gonna make a difference. So here's a couple more advocacy successes we've had in the recent future. I talked about the COVID-19 story campaign. We've had uh, over 80 people share their, their, their firsthand accounts about how they're dealing with this pandemic and they've all been really powerful. And just like Heather from Seattle, we'd be able to, to highlight a, a bunch of them and we're gonna to continue to highlight a bunch of them, hopefully on the Strongly blog, maybe with members of Congress on social media. So that's been a really successful campaign. And again, if you wanna do that, just go to our main advocacy site and you'll be able to do that right there. The public policy and advocacy conference that we had in the fall, not only did we have volunteers like, our, our, like the picture on the right show, uh, come to D.C. and meet with our members of Congress. We saw direct support from members of Congress of bills because of that conference. Just weeks after that, after that conference ended, co-sponsorships of bills that our volunteers lobbied on increased. So we got some great support because of those, those crucial one-on-one -on -one meetings. We've seen success in the newborn screening program lately. Again, I showed the example of HHS Secretary Alex Azar uh, restarting a key committee which is a great success, but I'll get to this in the next slide. We've seen st additional states start screening for more conditions such as SMA and Pompeii. We've seen progress on accessible air travel. 
We've even, we even had a campaign where over 200 advocates wrote the Department of Transportation and urged them to make lavatories more accessible in certain types of airplanes. We just wrapped up that campaign a couple weeks ago. Again, that's just another example of us being able to not only have an effect on Capitol Hill, but in our agencies. And we're waiting to see the results of that campaign. And then finally, this is one that's also very exciting is for many years now, the, the federal government has increased their investment in medical research. So for the last couple of years, Congress has continually increased the amount of money they have given the National Institutes of Health, which is the nation's largest funder of medical research. So this is a direct result of grassroots advocacy and advocacy programs that we're able to make sure that our federal government continues to invest crucial dollars in research and cures. So this is a map of uh, the map of our newborn screening program progress. So this map has lots of colors. It's very colorful, but it's just to show you that a couple things. One, each of these states that's, that has a color either screens for Pompeii, SMA, or both. And it's a patchwork right now. But I promise you, if I would have showed you this map a year ago, it would be a lot less colorful. So in the last year, we have seen a lot of states can begin to screen for SMA, Pompeii, or both. So this is an example of us having success in the newborn screening program. It's also an example of how sometimes we have to get, we have to work state by state to accomplish an advocacy goal. Uh, a lot of folks might think that we need to do everything at the federal level, but sometimes we need to do this state by state and a newborn screening program is a good example of that. The federal government can release guidelines, but it's up to each state to decide what conditions they screen for. So we wanna make sure this entire map is filled uh, with either orange, pink, or purple, but we're gonna have to do it state by state. So this is another example of sometimes not everything has to be done at the federal level. Sometimes your advocacy program has to be done state by state. So what can you do right now? We've listed a lot of uh, priorities that we work on. I've talked about our grassroots program. So what are things you can do right now? Well, first, if you haven't already, please join the network. Most of you can probably already check this one off because you're on this webinar. But if you're not getting our emails or not on the network, simply just go to mda.org backslash advocacy and you can sign up right there. So that's the easiest things you can do. Next, everyone on this call can ask their family and friends to join our efforts. We need as many voices as we can, urging our decision makers to not forget about the voice of the neuromuscular disease community. And we need those voices now more than ever. So please, if you know some people who might be interested in joining our advocacy uh, network, please ask them to. Again, they can just go to mda.org backslash advocacy. Number three is my personal favorite, again, is sharing your story. Again, this is the most important tool you have in your grassroots advocacy toolbox is your personal story. So here's two things you can do there. One, again, if you want to share your story about how COVID-19 is affecting you, please go to our advocacy website and do that. Also, next time you get an email from us asking you to take action on a, on a campaign, so if we ask you to email your member of Congress on, on an issue that's important to you, please insert your personal story. Please make that letter personal to you. We give you a template, we give you a sample letter, but please insert your personal story. You'd be surprised how effective that is on Capitol Hill. It really will make your letter stand out and it'll really cut through all the noise that they're hearing right now. So please get used to telling your story far and wide. It is sometimes a little uncomfortable, but it's so powerful. So that's my favorite one that you can do right now. Number four, just follow us on Twitter. So we're active on, on Twitter. Our, our account is right there. Our handle is right there. It's MDA underscore advocacy. Please give us a follow. That's the you'll see the most up-to-date uh, ways you can help or, or up-to-date advocacy news. And number five, keep your ears and eyes out for a new campaign we'll be launching in a couple of weeks around COVID-19. Uh, you, if you watch the news, you realize that Congress is currently debating a bunch of bills or one large bill, uh, whatever it will turn out to be, uh, to help with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we need to make sure they do not forget about the neuromuscular disease community when they craft that piece of legislation. So, uh, we're putting together a campaign right now for you to be able to raise your voice. So keep an eye out for that. Hopefully it'll come in the next week or so. So as we wrap up, before we take any questions, I just want to let you know that this is, was the kickoff. So thank you so much for coming. This is the kickoff of the Advocacy Institute. We are going to have session two in early June. We are just putting the finishing touches on what that topic will be. 
and the exact date and time, but um, it's shaping out to be pretty interesting. So uh, we'll make sure everyone, is, everyone in this call gets the invite to join that. Again, if you join our advocacy list, you'll get the invite, or if you follow us on Twitter, you'll see the invite as well. So with that, I think we'll take any questions that have come in. Uh, again, please, you can uh, use the Q&A function for some questions. And also, after we leave today, you can always email us at any time at advocacy at mdausa.org. Uh, we check that email box constantly. So that's the best way to get in touch with that. But with that, I'll open up to any questions that might have come in. Sure. Um I have a question here, and uh, this is directed towards uh, Paul, uh, and the question reads, um, what about easier access to clinical trials? Often the cost of travel to the clinical site prohibits individuals from otherwise participating. Any funding available? Yeah, that, that's really a fantastic question, and, and thanks for submitting that question. Um, so let me first say a few things that, that we're trying to do to uh, cut down the amount of travel necessary participate in clinical trials, because that's the best way to avoid uh, costs incurred in traveling to clinical trials uh, by just not traveling at all. Um, and the first way is to encourage uh, what, is, what, are, what are known as decentralized clinical trials. And these are trials in which participants actually participate from home, and they're able to uh, record how, uh, how well they're doing with the investigational therapy um, rather than having to go to a trial site and meeting with a trial representative or a monitor to go through the various tests that are necessary to see if the therapy may or may not be working and if there are any uh, safety concerns with the therapy, all that can actually be done in the home of the individual who is participating. So you avoid travel altogether that way. So we're, we're, we're working with FDA and other uh, partners in the space and trying to encourage those kinds of clinical trials. If any travel is necessary, we're also encouraging clinical trial uh, both uh, clinical trials as they're organized both at the FDA as well as at uh, biopharmaceutical companies to include more local options to try to avoid having to fly across the country or go to that university medical center 300 miles away. Uh, maybe there's only a, like three trial sites open for this specific trial. We're trying to avoid those situations because we know that that does not work and that's when, uh, that's when travel is uh, arduous and it can also be expensive. Um, the final thing to say is if tr uh, travel to a university medical center or some other faraway place is necessary and it is getting expensive, um, there are resources out there to uh, try to assist with those costs. Oftentimes they're trial specific. Uh, oftentimes companies might be willing to cover those costs. Some other companies might not be willing to cover those costs. There are also organizations out there that offer assistance for individuals traveling to clinical trial sites. Um, what I would recommend that you do is actually reach out to MDA's Resource Center. Our Resource Center is a fantastic um, a group of uh, folks who are there to answer those exact kind of questions, those exact kind of uh, challenges, and looking for assistance in uh, finding financial assistance to be able to travel to the trial sites. Um, just as a quick, um, quick plug for them, uh, you can reach them at one eight three three ask mda one um, also Resource Center at MDA USA. Uh, dot org. Um, it's a great way to, to reach some really knowledgeable folks who can help out with those kinds of things. Thanks, Paul. Uh, that was really great. I see we have a lot of other questions coming in, so I'm just going to go ahead and, um, and start answering all of those. Um, our, first, our next one up is from Barry Glaberman, and he asks, you know, how MDA is addressing the needs of older patients living with neuromuscular conditions. So, you know, I will say from the advocacy perspective here, obviously we, we advocate on behalf of the entire neuromuscular community from people who are diagnosed at birth to those who might be diagnosed later on in life. And then through the care center network, we fund, you know, over 150 sites that provide service and care for, for people in the community. Um, I would say that so far as you might have questions specifically about access to care or services um, for older neuromuscular disease patients, I think that the Resource Center is, all, is probably the best place to direct those for now, and then we'll have the appropriate person get back to you. But we're always happy to, to try and make those connections. But obviously, the advocacy department is committed to um, you know, advocating on behalf of the entire community. Our next question is, uh, where does the MDA stand on universal health care coverage? We think everyone needs to have affordable, accessible, comprehensive health insurance. This is absolutely um, essential 
for people living with and without pre-existing conditions, including a neuromuscular condition. Um, it is, it, you know, MDA has advocated um, against the repeal of patient provisions in the Affordable Care Act. We don't believe that the law is perfect. However, it is better than where we were before it passed. Um, there are essential provisions in there that ensure that people have health insurance that covers what they need and that it can be affordable. Um, we will continue to advocate for that and we welcome um, any and all, you know, advocacy support from our community when it comes to universal health insurance. Um, Elizabeth Kilroy asks, how does the MDA anticipate supporting summer camps and research in the coming years with the absence of major fundraising events? Elizabeth, this is this is a critical issue right now. I have to I have to say that we are at a point for for MDA where fundraising, obviously, we're in the same place as a number of other leading national organizations, nonprofit healthcare organizations right now, where um, fundraising is a challenge. I, you know, as as the lead of the advocacy department, am you know not intimately, you know, familiar with with the. Um, with the strategy around this, I know that there is a um, you know a, a great deal of leadership happening on this across MDA, and obviously we welcome partnership from people across the entire community, whether they be advocates and patients or friends and families, to help us with this because delivering these services to you know to the community, whether that's summer camp funding for our care network research funding or anything else that we deliver on is the mission of MDA. And that is overall the absolutely most important thing that we do, but, but we can't do it without bringing in, without bringing in funding. And so, um, you know, you're getting at something that, that is an issue for the entire nonprofit community, but especially for an organization as essential as MDA, which actually connects patients with the care that they need and, and funds critical groundbreaking research. And, and it's something that we're, that we're working towards. Um, Nikki Diaz, um, hi Nikki, it's nice to hear from you. Um, she says, I understand the Public Health Authority has documented that at-risk COVID patients, sorry, jumping, may not be guaranteed a ventilator if they should need one. So there are a number of um, triage policies in place in states across the country that are discriminatory, violate the ADA, and oftentimes necessitate that people with underlying conditions not be prioritized for access to care in the event of a pandemic. MDA has worked very hard with a number of our partners across the patient community and um, the community representing people living with disabilities to advocate before HHS and state authorities that these triage policies need to be overturned and they need to be overturned now. We have not heard of rationing of care yet, because of them, but it is a, there is still a possibility of it. Um, HHS's Office of Civil Rights has issued guidance on this, stating that these policies are discriminatory and that they should not exist. However, um, because each state and hospital system, frankly, manages their own policies, because these decisions are oftentimes made made by ethical boards behind closed doors, we don't know what's going on and we, we don't know how care might be rationed. Now, thankfully, we haven't seen it yet, but we could see it. And so what I would say is, you know, to the extent that our community can keep your ear to the ground and let us know if you are hearing about these things, please don't hesitate to reach out. Please send them to the advocacy email address um, that's at the bottom of the screen. Thank you for that question. Um, Diane Disney says, um, most people and doctors don't have a clue what Pompeii is. Um, what plans do you have for general public information cam campaign? This needs to precede advocacy. So MDA as an organization obviously advocates on 43 different neuromuscular conditions. Every one of them is rare. Um, Pompeii is one of the conditions, one of two conditions that is currently screened for um, through the newborn screening program. We are, um, MDA is, is really proud to partner with another, a couple of other Pompeii groups on patient-focused drug development for Pompeii patients. And I'll let Paul speak to that a little bit in just a minute. But I understand kind of um, where you're coming from on this, especially with rare diseases. Sometimes it's hard to break through the noise of, of everything else that's going on with different you know, subspecialists and, and providers to try and ensure that, that they understand what, you know, kind of what conditions people are living with, especially when they're rare. Um, the issue with this though is, you know, through the, through the MDA's care center network, our doctors that we fund have information, they get regular updates 
on on the conditions that we cover and and they and they they do receive you know vet med ed that that, that they really need to be able to take care of the of, of the neuromuscular disease patients that we represent um, to the extent that you may hear otherwise please again contact the resource center about that um, so that we can be sure to step in where appropriate um, if there is a you know any any instance where we can do that and I'll turn it briefly over to Paul so that he can speak to the um, Pompeii patient focused drug development piece. Yeah, thank you, Brittany. I think you gave an excellent overview there of, of all the ways in which MDA is trying to raise the profile of the rare diseases that, that we represent. One of those uh, ways is trying to raise the profile of, of these diseases, including Pompeii, and in this case, specifically Pompeii, uh, both with the Food and Drug Administration as well as the government more generally, um, but also with the biopharmaceutical industry, trying to educate them on uh, in this case, Pompeii disease. And one of the best ways of doing that is through a patient-focused drug development meeting. And this is a meeting in which uh, we try to gather as many folks from the community as possible uh, to talk about their experience with Pompeii disease, both uh, their road to a diagnosis, as well as um, their experience with current treatments, enzyme replacement therapy, and other treatments individuals are pursuing for uh, treating Pompeii disease. Um, as well as uh, just what it's generally like to live with Pompeii disease. What are the daily challenges? What are the challenges in, in getting up the stairs or, or going to work or uh, being able to, uh, to, 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 to exercise perhaps? So all sorts of ways in which the general public, the Food and Drug Administration, biopharmaceutical industry, physicians, you, the, the list goes on, just don't understand because they don't live with Pompeii themselves and perhaps they've never encountered someone. So patient-focused drug development meeting is, is a great way to educate the FDA and uh, also uh, biopharmaceutical industry on this. I'm going to say you're going to hear more from us on this shortly. You know that we actually have planned to have a, a meeting on March 9th here in Washington, D.C. Uh, on, uh, on Pompeii disease, but you may remember that was right at the outset of uh, the current outbreak, and uh, we didn't want to put 150 individuals from the Pompeii community in a room uh, and at risk at that time. So we're, we're rethinking that model and we're hopeful that we can announce something very shortly on, on gathering the community again in another format uh, to educate the FDA and educate the biopharmaceutical industry on Pompeii disease. But back to the original question, absolutely awareness is key uh, for Pompeii disease as well as the other diseases within our umbrella. Thank you, Paul. Um, our next question is from Nikki Diaz. Um, have we considered virtual fundraising events? Yes. Um, we had our very first virtual gala about a week ago. Um, there are many more virtual fundraising events in the queue. If you um, are interested in participating in any of these um, and, and, you know, kind of publicizing them for us, we would love, love, love your partnership on this. And, and I know that I have a couple of colleagues from um, MDA's fundraising side of the house on the call today. Um, so what I'll say is just keep an eye out on our Twitter feed, on our website, um, and our Facebook feed for, for those kinds of opportunities. And thank you so much for, for asking that question and bringing that up about the support. It is, it is absolutely critical that we're able to um, be able to continue to provide, you know, kind of vital services to our community. Um, our next question comes from, just one second, um, from Antoinette, and she is asking about uh, complex rehab technology coverage. Yes, this is something that MDA is involved in on the advocacy side. We are partnering with a number of other like-minded patient advocacy organizations on this. Um, there are obviously, you know, a number of ways to get involved in this, but look, for out, look out for more from us on this moving forward, uh, probably later in the summer, opportunities to advocate directly through MDA. Um, and I believe that is the last question. If there are any other questions, go ahead and type them into the Q&A um, and we will take them from there and I'll give it just another minute. Okay, seeing none, um, I will go ahead and just give a few last brief remarks. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for this very first um, 
for this very first installment of the MDA Advocacy Institute. Obviously, we're just kicking this off now in this very uh, strange time that we are all living in and are really receptive to your feedback here. If you have any feedback on how this event went, um, ways that we could do it better, please send that to advocacy at mdausa.org to get in touch with us. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Um, stay tuned for all of the other upcoming events that we have. Uh, we are going to be bringing on a number of outside experts to speak about different issues here in the coming months. We're really excited about being able to provide that kind of direct connection um, to, you know, the, the administration, to agencies over at HHS, possibly DOT, and Congress here um, throughout the this whole series and, and we're really looking forward to having you know more more people joining us going forward so please be sure to share with your friends and family I actually see one last question that just came in um, so this question is for Mark um, any M Mark Fisher any advice on how to better advocate on a more local level for services that impact the disability community I think that this question really gets to you know what does advocacy mean in general for for you know someone as um, either advocating with MDA like we do on the national level or advocating, you know, for better services or better accessibility on the local level. And so I'll let Mark speak to this now. Yeah, I think that's great. So I think, first of all, um, at the local level, I mean, that's the, that's one of the places you can really make some change is at your local level, you know, your local school boards, your local city councils, those are some of the places that you can make the most change. And it's probably the easiest way to get to know some of those decision makers. You can easily go to your mayor's office or your county council's office and really, it's easier to get to know them than probably your member of Congress. So if you're comfortable going there, that's fantastic and establishing that relationship, that's, that's amazing. I think a couple of things. One, um, please contact the, the address on your screen, I've seen mdausa.org if this interests you. You know, we do do a lot of federal work no doubt about that and we do state work as well a little state work with the, the newborn screening program um, we can't be everywhere everywhere though so if you're really interested in doing some local work please get in touch with me with that email address i'm happy to maybe send you any sort of fact sheet you might need or talking points that might be helpful to your local member if you want to do that i think your greatest my great to my sorry the best thing is to get to know them get to know them introduce yourself make sure they know who you are in your community so you can get that one-on-one -on -one face time with them. Also, a lot of folks at the local level end up graduating to the state level and to the federal level. So establishing a relationship early is key as that member, as that decision maker moves up in their political career. And then I think your best tool is your story. So again, get to know them, share your story with them, get them, have them get to know you, and then you become a resource for them. So if they have a question about, how, how would this bill that I'm working on affect you as someone who, who might live in the mirror muscle abuse community? You become the resource and then you become even more of a powerful advocate. So really it's establishing that relationship is probably your key first step. But if you want any more information or any sort of guidance or advice or anything that we could help you with, please just email us at that email address above your screen. We're happy to do that. But I love local advocacy, so go for it. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. I think that was a great last question to wrap up um, the, the call. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining, especially right now. Um, keep a lookout in your inbox and on our Twitter and on our, on our page on the MDA uh, website for what else is to come. And we look forward to seeing all of you again next month. Thank you.